Our next speaker uh, will be Dr. Islam Ayman, lecturer of anesthesia in Talk about anesthesia for hip surgery. Should we change our practice? Father. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank you for attending this session. I would like to thank the chairpersons. Uh, our uh, session is talking about uh, pain therapy and the evidence based. We are talking mainly about acute pain, and like my dear colleague said, acute pain is very, is very important uh, because it is un, uh, uh, inadequate control of acute pain is one of the main problems that predispose the patient for chronic pain afterwards. So we must control acute pain. Uh, my, my talk is about uh, hip surgery and the, and the new evidence about uh, uh, methods of anesthesia and pain control in hip surgery. Uh, what are the main hip pathologies that we encounter that require surgical interventions? We have the osteoarthritis, we have the uh, AVN, whether uh, post-traumatic, like after neck frac uh, fracture of neck of the femur, or idiopathic. Uh, this, what are types of surgeries that we'll see? We'll see the hemiarthroplasty, we'll see the total hip arthroplasty. We can also see the traumatic fixation like the DHS, like the dynamic hip screws, and, uh, and nowadays hip arthroscopy is gaining uh, some more momentum. So uh, I don't know if uh, this was intentional when the scientific committee uh, and Dr. Muhammad called me to prepare a session about the hip surgery. I don't, uh, that uh, me myself was a hip surgery patient I don't know if it was intended or not, but uh, actually this is my actual imaging. I was involved in a motor car, uh, motorcycle accident about two years ago. Uh, thankfully, I'm here with you today. Uh, I was, uh, the accident resulted in multiple hip fractures and a posterior dislocation in the hip joints. Uh, this is after fixation, uh, but Unfortunately, I developed uh, a vascular necrosis of the neck of the femur, and I, this is my hip that I have now. I undergo total hip replacement. Uh, the surgeries, uh, the four or five surgeries I, perf uh, I was subjected to was done by my dear professor, Dr. Hazim Abdul Azim, and my anesthesiologist by my dear professor, Dr. Abdul Rahman Fathallah, with the help of Dr. Rami Kunaisi and Dr. Ayman Abu Gabal. Uh, I will talk about my experience later as an anesthesiologist, as a pain physician, after I finish my talk. Uh, okay. So, uh, to start the talk, we should know the nerve supply of the hip joint. Uh, one of the problems that we face in the hip joint is that it has a very wide nerve supply, starting from L1 till the S3. This is the sensory and the motor nerve supply. And, some, and uh, the problem with the hip joint surgery is also that, we need, that sometimes we need to block the motor, the motor supply also, not the nerve supply, to facilitate the uh, manipulation of the joint and replacement of the joint. So sometimes sensory block alone is not enough. Sometimes we need the muscles to relax. Uh, we have the genital femoral nerve, the obturator, the lateral femoral cutaneous, the femoral, the tibial, the common peroneal, and the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. Okay. Uh, according to the American uh, Joint Replacement Registry and the annual report in 2016, the, uh, the age distribution of hip arthroplasties is uh, take a wide range from starting from 30s till, till the end, but most of hip replacement surgeries are performed around the age of 63 years old. This, the, the, the most uh, replacement done is the, this age. Uh, the diagnosis that requires this hip replacement mainly osteoarthritis, the, the second most common is femoral neck fracture, and then vascular necrosis and complica other complications. What are the challenges that we meet when we anesthetize a patient for uh, hip replacement? They are usually a senior patients, like seen first, with the many comorbidities that is associated with these senior patients. There may be another comorbidities that may predispose to the problem itself, like presence of rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis, with the challenges that it provides either in regional anesthesia or in general anesthesia. And 
most of the cases, in cases of hip replacement, we need early mobilization for many things, for the sake of the surgery and to minimize post-operative complications. So this must be put in mind in the type of anesthesia and analgesia that we provide. We need to man maintain some motor power and we need very good analge analgesia to allow the patient to early mobilize or move. What, can type, what types of anesthesia can we use for uh, hip replacement surgery? We have, of course, the GA, the neuroaxial, spinal, epidural, or combined. And nowadays, they started, like we, like we will see, they started the paravertebral, the lumbar plexus, and the sacral plexus. Or even some papers talked about local infiltration blocks. So, what is the evidence? What, the, what is the evidence we have now about what type of anesthesia to use to control the pain inside the OR and after the OR? In 2014, the World Journal of Orthopedics, perioperative outcomes and type of anesthesia in hip surgical patients, they made an evidence-based review. Sorry. Okay. Uh, they found that in regional, that regional anesthesia improved outcome regarding overall mortality, thrombombolic events, blood loss, transfusion requirements. They also found that it is widely underused. Uh, all of the patients involved in the uh, evidence review, uh, about 36% of them was managed by regional anesthesia. The rest was managed by general anesthesia. They found that regional anesthesia could be a major factor in reducing medical and economic adverse events. In the Journal of Arthroplasty in 2015, does neuroaxial anesthesia decrease transfusion rates? We know that transfusion of blood during the operation is one of the major concerns. Uh, it, in itself, it can cause many complications, whether intraoperative or postoperative, like the uh, intraoperative reaction, infection, or trally. So if I can, if my technique can help in reducing the transfusion, blood transfusion, this is, would be uh, beneficial. So they found that uh, 20, in nearly 29,000 total hip replacements, about 39% were by neuroaxial. They were performed between 2005 and 2012. Neuroaxial anesthesia resulted in lower rates of transfusion, pneumonia, unplanned intubation, prolonged intubation, stroke, all complications, and medical complications. Also, operative time and length of stay were, short, were, were shorter as well. So they concluded that neuroaxial anesthesia demonstrated a significantly reduced risk of transfusion, and this was uh, after a multivariate regression to compensate for the comorbidities of the patient. In the International Journal of Clinical Experimental Medicine 2015, also a comparison of general versus regional anesthesia for hip fracture surgery. This was a meta-analysis. They included seven trials with a total of nearly 36,000 general anesthetics and 34,000 regional anesthetics. In this study, they found no significant difference regarding the 30-day mortality between the two types. We, like we see the plot, uh, most of the lines are near the middle line, so this means that there is no significant difference between both sides. In anesthesiology in 2016, anesthesia technique and mortality after hip, total hip or near arthroplasty. This was a propensity score match uh, per analysis. They included 4,000 patients. They calculated the dirty date mortality was 0.19% in the spinal anesthesia group and 0.8% in the general anesthesia group. Spinal anesthesia was also associated with a shorter hospital stay, 5.7 days vs 6.6 .6 days, in comparison, of course, with general anesthesia. Also, uh, all the evidence that is present near Latin now doesn't uh, uh, look into the effect of our anesthetic technique on the post-operative mobility. We said that the hip patient, we need early mobilization to prevent post-operative complications. So we, we have no clear evidence to support that the use of regional anesthesia can improve or uh, can increase or decrease the time for mobility. So there is a 
there is a trial that is ongoing now, actually, the Regain trial, original versus general anesthesia for promoting independence after hip fracture. This was in British Medical Journal. It is, this study is recruiting now on clinicaltrials.gov. I think when the results will appear, we can, we can know if the original anesthesia can affect the time for recovery after anesthesia or not. They will include 1,600 patients aged above 50 and above. They will randomly allocate them between general anesthesia and spinal anesthesia. The primary outcome will be the composite of death or new inability to walk 10 feet or across a room at 60 days after randomization, which, which is reflected into the post-operative ambulation. In ACTA or Sepedica in 2016, uh, they Similar, they uh, discussed the mortality between general and regional anesthesia. It was nearly 7,500 participants compared odds of mortality, which was marginally lower with spinal anesthesia, but in similar in patients with mixed anesthesia. And this is strange. The mortality was marginally lower in regional only, but when we gave regional plus mixed, was the same mortality. But anyway, it didn't reach scientific. Uh, uh, the statistical significance. So they termed that the, it is nearly equal, the mortality is equal. In regional anesthesia and pain medicine in 2016, the impact of neuroaxial versus general anesthesia on the incidence of post-operative surgical site infections. They want to know if the anesthetic technique can affect the surgical site infections. This was a meta-analysis. They found that the evidence supports the overall beneficial effect of neuroaxial anesthesia on decreasing the incidence of surgical site infection. So then neuroaxial anesthesia can affect and cause a reduction in surgical site infections. So, also lastly in 2017, no clinical difference comparing, this was a somewhat uh, uh, they studied the cases of about 18 patients, 18,000 patients between 2009-2015 that underwent primary hip replacement. They found that opioid requirements was significantly higher with general and combination anesthesia. And this is also strange, that when we gave general anesthesia with the original, this increased the opioid requirements. And they didn't have an explanation for this. Uh, the opioid requirements only decreased when we gave regional alone. They also found that pain scores and pain management satisfaction were significantly better in regional and in combination anesthesia. The, the Clinical Journal of Pain 2017, peripheral nerve block as a supplement to light or deep general anesthesia. And here they started to get away from the neuroaxial to test for other, mo other modes of peripheral blocks like the lumbar plexus block. They compared lumbar plexus block with GA or GA alone. They found that lumbar plexus block reduced opioid intake decre and decreased incidence of post-operative delirium and post-operative cognitive decline and dysfunction when it is used with light sedation, but found no difference in complication within the 30 days of search. And lastly, in BMC anesthesiology in 2017, actually last month, they, it is a case report. Uh, they discussed the management of four patients with ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, they undergone the total hip replacement with three blocks, a T12 paravertebral, a lumbar plexus, and a sacral plex, to avoid all the hassle of neuroaxial and uh, upper airway management, either in general or neuroaxial. And they did the four patients su successfully during and post-operative analgesia with three blocks. So. What we want to know, the take home message, current evidence support the consideration of using regional anesthesia in hip surgery. But we must say also that the anesthesiologist should choose the type of anesthesia in the context of the clinical scenario. And lastly, that we need more randomized controlled studies to explore the effect of different types of surgical of anesthetic techniques, whether regional or neuroaxial or peripheral blocks or GA, on the 
final outcomes of the patient, like the mobility and satisfaction and things like this. We have very, mo very, uh, uh, very low number of, RC of quality RCTs that address these issues. Thank you. Uh, I would like, I would like uh, only to say one thing. Uh, upon my personal experience, uh, pain is a, a very, very, very unpleasant experience. Very unpleasant experience. Uh, especially the orthopedic pain or the pain of the bone, bone origin. It is a very unpleasant experience. And one of our main jobs is to control and to treat pain in patients. Uh, and to prevent, of course, and to prevent, of course. Second, uh, the four operations or the five operations that I've done, I've done it under spinal epidural analgesia. And actually, the experience I remember, the memory I experienced was very pleasant experience, either intraoperative or perioperative. The only, I received light sedation during the anesthesia and the few moments that I remember during the surgical uh, operations was a very pleasant experience. I wasn't bothered at all. Uh, I don't know. I'm not in pain, yes. One of the best moments in my life was in the two hours that, after, uh, that was after the operation when the original anesthesia was still uh, strong. And of course, I, I continued on the epidural for two days. And then I was off epidural. And one more thing I want to say, whatever the type of IV analgesia that we use, it will never, never, never come near regional blocks. Never. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stem.